on Inside Story, a deadly conspiracy. It was cold, it was callous. Three conniving women with murder on their minds. Never come across such contempt for human life. The jealous wife. I had no knowledge in what was going to happen. Her sister and her mother. Because I'm the only one with the guts to come forward. The unsuspecting husband. No inkling, none whatsoever. And the hitman they hire to gun him down. I can't do this shit, mate. She's got a motive for murder and she's got a plan. Oh, shit! How bad blood in the family can end in murder. <laughs> Hello, I'm Leila McKinnon. Welcome to Inside Story. Somehow it seems like the ultimate betrayal, a killer in the family. A killer angry enough, sick enough, to destroy the life of someone they supposedly love. Tom Steinfurt's been investigating. Yeah, Leila, these are crimes that are mostly driven by passion and greed when all of a sudden love just turns into loathing and the people that are supposed to care most out of nowhere become murderers. And most worryingly here, it's all too common. It's unthinkable, but as you'll see, all too real. On a moonlit night on October 23, 2009, two shots ring out. Cracking the still air of a country night, leaving Jeff Ryan lying alone, his life seeping away in the dark. It was cold, it was callous, it was premeditated. It was a total disrespect for life. Jeff's shattered body will lie there on the cold ground for 12 hours until he's eventually found dead next morning by a neighbour. He was left on the ground to die, without a hand to hold, without, without anything, you know, without somebody there to comfort him. What police discover about Jeff Ryan's murder shocks even the most hardened investigators. Three women had plotted to carry out the brutal killing. Jeff's wife, her sister and her mother. I had nothing whatsoever to gain by wanting my husband killed. I've never come across a group of um, women that have such, I suppose, contempt for human life as these particular women. She you... told me if I speak up, I'd be going to another funeral. As we'll see tonight, what drove these women to kill were the most basic of all human emotions. Lust, revenge, and greed. To sit here and tell you that three women plan virtually the assassination of my brother is beyond comprehension. In South Australia, a crime so heartless that it challenges our very notion of family, the murder of Glennis Haywood. No, 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 no. Glennis died at the hands of her violent, controlling husband, Neil, after years of abuse. Shut up. No, no. But it was the treachery of her youngest son, Matthew, that makes this crime so shocking. I'll never forgive Matthew. Never. He lured his mother to a house where his vengeful father was waiting to kill her. It's hard to imagine what must have gone through her mind knowing that the son that she thought she could trust and loved has betrayed her. As we will discover, it was a murder planned in minute detail between father and son. She thought that Matthew still, still loved her. She was very, very happy about that. And uh, she never came back. But first, Tamworth, New South Wales. Jeff Ryan is dead. His family is devastated and mystified. 49 with four children from two marriages, Jeff was well liked in this prime farming district. Heart wrenching. He's an everyday family with a with a, a man who just gave everything to his community and and he was callously gunned down. 
From the very beginning, there were many questions surrounding this murder. Firstly, who'd want to kill Jeff Ryan? He was a hardworking cattleman, well respected in this tight-knit community. But perhaps more perplexing was the fact that when Jeff was ambushed and shot, his wife Helen was at home just 400 metres away, but she claimed she didn't hear a thing. She's only a few hundred metres away and claimed not to hear the gunshot. No. Do you buy that for a minute? No. She reckons the TV was up and all, but no. Mr Ryan's mother and son made an emotional plea to the public for information about his death. What unfolds is a bizarre murder plot, a triangle of evil, and how these three women, Jeff's wife Helen, her sister Janine and mother Coralie did it, is so cold-blooded that it defies belief. Surely one of three could have said, this is a very stupid idea. Is there not some way we can work around this? Where is the respect for someone's life? There was none. Such was Helen Ryan's contempt for her husband's life that within days of his murder, she's spreading rumours about him, creating false leads to cover her guilt. Helen was having conversations about Jeff's background and that he was acting strangely and, and um, maybe involved with um, people with a criminal history. Um, however, we obtained a, a large num number of statements and nearly all of them said that Jeffrey was a, was a good bloke. Meanwhile, police are whittling down their list of suspects. Almost from the beginning, they believed it was anything but a random killing. You knew something was wrong straight away when you hugged her that first time after Jeff was killed. Describe that hug for me. Like a piece of concrete, <coughs> really cold concrete. You know, you put your arms around cold concrete because there was no give in it whatsoever. No, she was hard and cold. Coming up on Inside Story. The whole family were thick as thieves. The intrigues, the affairs and the ruthless plot to kill Jeff Ryan. She was tough as nails. This countryside is so typically Australian. It's little wonder Jeff Ryan loved it so much. Can you believe that in somewhere so beautiful, something so awful could happen? <laughs> no, no, I don't think, not just, I don't think anyone expected something so horrific to happen. Ryan's marriage to Helen was spawned in an unusual set of circumstances. He first met her when he was going out with her sister, Janine. But within a few months, he'd fallen for Helen instead. There was a problem, though. She was already married to a bloke called Graham Pateman. So when was the moment you twigged that Jeff had stolen your wife? Believe it or not, Tom, the moment was when I come home and she wasn't here. I thought, well, is she shopping? Has she gone to see a friend? And strangely enough, uh, the sister Janine, she was worried also because she hasn't heard from Jeff Ryan for a few days, see? And um, she was come over to the house. Do you, have you heard from Helen? I said, no. I said, I haven't heard from Helen. She said, I haven't heard from Jeff neither. You know, and that's when we looked at each other and it twigged. Married life with Helen wasn't the idyllic country existence that Jeff Ryan imagined. The tough reality hit when the big drought forced him to find work in town in 2008. The marriage then began falling apart. Before long, Jeff had started a relationship with Robin Draper, a woman he was working with. At first it was a friendship um, type of relationship where um, he was able to disclose problems and discuss things that were going on at home with this particular lady. And f from our inquiries, it, we believe that that relationship eventually became uh, somewhat intimate and that he was quite um, taken with her. Helen was furious when she learned of Jeff's affair, even though, as it turned out, she was having one herself. I think Helen 
was in in some sense insanely jealous of of Jeff's ability to be able to mix with people. I think she was extremely jealous of Jeff's relationship with Robin. By this stage, they're living in separate bedrooms in the family home. Clearly, things aren't working, and finally, Jeff realises that it just can't go on like this. He's had enough, and he goes to see a lawyer. The path to divorce is now certain. Helen demands the cattle property, as well as 50% of their assets. Jeff offers 30%, but she knocks it back. The situation at home is now toxic, and soon things start getting physical. But it's Helen who's the aggressor. I saw the actual bruises. Did he say what happened? I don't know whether he was sleeping, but she attacked him on the bed because they were separate dreams and then she attacked him on the bed. Jeff's forced to move out of the family home and lives nearby in a shipping container. It's become a bitter standoff, and Jeff is increasingly alarmed by Helen's behaviour. One of the strange photos that we've seen is of Helen standing at the edge of the shipping container, just staring at Jeff. It's a bit psychotic, isn't it? Oh, God, you do imagine it. Terrible. Helen Ryan is out for revenge. Her husband's having an affair, she's about to be divorced, and she's far from happy with the settlement he's offering her. She's got a motive for murder, and she's got a plan. But to carry it out, she's going to need some help. So, strangely, she turns to the woman that she stole Jeff off in the first place, her sister, Janine. Thick as thieves. The whole family were thick as thieves. There's an old saying, you know, blood's thicker than water. Well, that is a, a, a true saying. Janine is hardly the girl next door. She's a long-term drug user and one-time prostitute. Conviction for dealing in stolen property. I, I remember asking her one day, I said, what are you going to do when you leave school, Janine? I said, you know, you got any plans? Or... And she looked me straight in the eye and I can still see it today. She said, Graham, she said, um, I think I'll go into the prostitution industry. And it, I couldn't believe, even today I think about it and I have a little giggle to myself, and that's exactly what she did. Janine had built a web of contacts on the seedy side of life. People who, for a price, could help get rid of Jeff for good. In September 2009, Helen Ryan meets her hitman Ken Brooks here in Tamworth. He's a former truckie, now on a disability pension, and he's got an amphetamine habit to support. Perhaps not the most reliable gunman, but he assures her that he's up to the task. So she hands over photos of her husband Jeff, plus $500 to cover his expenses. The job is on. As, as, a, uh, as a person you'd want to hire to do this sort of work, um... You, you couldn't hope for a worse person, I don't think. So Helen has her gunman, but now she's got a new problem. How is she going to come up with $30,000 for the hit? Well, that's where her mother, Coralie, comes in. She generously stumps up for the deposit. I suppose a bit like B out of Prisoner or Judy Marine out of um, Underbelly, something like that. Bit of a matriarch. 73-year-old Coralie is a mother of six and a grandmother too. But she's not the sweet granny she appears to be. She was very hard and, and basically you, you think butter wouldn't melt on the outside of her, but inside she was you know, tough as nails. On October 23, 2009, hitman Ken Brooks rings yeah. Helen Ryan to yeah. tell her the hit's it's going tonight. down tonight. We believe Ken was ringing Helen at that stage to basically find out the location of where Jeffrey was so that he could follow through and carry out the, um, the murder. Jeff's at the house, as he is every night, to feed the dogs. He even has a cup of coffee with Helen, oblivious to the fact that his wife is planning his final moments. I was probably the last one he spoke to, you know, and he was going to watch uh, Da Vinci Code. Did he have any inkling that he was about to be killed? No inkling, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. 
Sometime between 7.30 and 8.15, Jeff leaves the house to go back to the shipping container he's moved into. He's Brooks back. phones Helen, who tells him Jeff's exact location. The murder target and the gunman are now each on their pathway to a terrible conclusion. Sometime after 8.40, Jeff hears a car approaching, so he goes outside to investigate. Within seconds, he's hit by a blast from a 12-gauge shotgun. He may have been laying here crying out for someone if some you know and then you start you start having these horrendous thoughts if someone was here straight away and and did something would have something have done but jeff's gone the pathologist was of the opinion that it would have taken some minutes for him to die and that he would have been in extreme pain when it uh, when it happened coming up the hitman himself I can't remember shit, man. I can't remember what happened yesterday. A ruthless murder plot has come to its terrible climax. A cold and calculated killing. But from very early in their investigation, police have their suspicions about exactly who killed Jeffrey Ryan. All they need is the evidence to prove it. In the end, that would come down to a mix of high-tech police work, painstaking detail, and the careless trail left by the increasingly confident killers. There's Helen. No, there's the car. Excellent. Coralie's in the car. Um, we're then able to overhear the conversations where all three women basically confirm their roles and what each, and each one of them had done, where monies had gone, what accounts they used. I believed that we had a huge amount of evidence against the three women. From the start, some members of Jeff's family weren't fooled by Helen Ryan's public displays of grief either. She played this wonderful grieving widow at the funeral, you know, the sob sob. Were there tears? Were there tissues? There were pretend tears. Specialist police divers, sniffer dogs and firearm experts have also combed his farm to search for clues. The weapon used to murder Jeff Ryan is never found, but police are also building a case against the hitman, Ken Brooks. In December 2009, he's brought in for questioning, but he appears a little worse for wear. Her phone number is? No, I don't know numbers, mate. I told you that earlier. No, I've just got to ask, mate. I can't remember shit, mate. I can't remember what happened yesterday. It's yeah, just stupid. Anyone who can point a gun and shoot is bright enough to be a hitman if they, if they want to be. It doesn't take brains to do it. Do you know a fellow by the name of Jeffrey Ryan who lives in Tamworth? No. Do you uh, know any person by the name of Janine Coulter? No. No? <laughs> what about Coral Coulter? No. Where do these names come from? There's not enough evidence to charge him yet. But in January of 2010, three months after the murder, the police set up a sting to nab the hapless hitman after he receives Helen's final payment. The money is handed over. But as soon as Helen leaves, the police swoop on Brooks. Oh, shit! The day after Brooks is nicked, police arrest Helen Ryan, her mother Coralie, and her sister Janine. The charge is murder. What involvement did you have in respect of the murder of your husband, Jeffrey Ryan? I had no involvement in it. No, no involvement at all? No knowledge in what was going to happen at all. The evidence is damning, but Helen Ryan claims she never wanted her husband murdered. Because I paid the $5,000 to have him roughed up. And then, then I find out that he's been killed and I was terrified that I would cook. This is what would happen and I would get the blame and people would point the finger at me. And already she's trying to shift the blame to her sister. Janine told me back in 94, I think it was around the time when we, Jeff left her for me, that she would get me. 
Okay. Was anyone present when that conversation oh, took place? I have no idea. I didn't believe a word that came out of Helen's mouth. <laughs> if she told me the sun was shining and it was a day, I'd still go out and check before I believed what she told me. But she basically tried to shift blame um, to other people. How would you describe Helen? I think she's a narcissist and uh, basically, uh, as a person, uh, she's a very uh, cruel and selfish woman. Uh, I've never met anyone quite like her. Did Helen ever tell you what um, she hoped to gain uh, for having Jeff killed? You can answer that question. Did she ever explain to you what she was hoping to gain? Property. In the end, Janine proved to be the weak link and eventually rolled over. Have you got any anything that will corroborate that? No, because I'm the only one with the guts to come forward. Right. Have you spoken to your mother about this? No. So she's unaware that you're here now? Um, have you spoken to Helen about this? She knows, she knows I'm here now. <laughs> she knows so, I'm here now. Was she aware what you are going to say? No. At the trial, the three women turn on each other. Coralie claims that she was an unwitting participant, duped into paying money to the hitman. Helen says that she just wanted Jeff roughed up so that he wouldn't divorce her. But Janine, she testifies against her mother and sister, spelling out the whole sordid story. The triangle is now well and truly broken. Certainly the jury had no doubts about their guilt, and after just three hours of deliberation, Helen and Coralie are found guilty of murder. Helen is sentenced to a minimum of 27 years and Coralie to 18. Janine is found guilty of conspiracy to murder and gets seven and a half years. I was heartbroken, you know, $30,000 for a life. How can you put a price on somebody's life to start with? And to have somebody think that that's what my dad was worth is, it's not something that sits well with me. The hitman, Ken Brooks, has also been found guilty. But he's got one loyal friend, Peter Imbanoni, who still has doubts about that verdict. I don't think he would have done it for any amount of money. I think if this man had done something to Kenneth, I think then Kenneth would have took his head off with a baseball bat. And I'm going to, I'm going to, stay, I'm going to stay that. But I don't believe he would shoot him. It's sort of splitting hairs though, isn't it? Saying he'd kill someone with a baseball bat, but not with a gun. But that's his personality. I just can't see him picking up a gun and shooting a man. And he was a terrible shot anyway, all right? Believe me, I've been shooting with him. He's a shocking shot. Well, one shot missed and one hit. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> I read that too. Still to come on Inside Story, the violence, the fear. He beat hell out of her. The daring escape. She virtually blew to Sir Wilbur. And then the betrayal by the son she loved. I'll never forgive Matthew. Never. Jeff Ryan's murder was shocking and unexpected, but at least there is an explanation. Base human emotions like greed and jealousy. Some crimes, though, simply defy understanding. It was a crime so cruel, so brutal. What Glennis Haywood endured beggars belief. We are treating uh, her disappearance as suspicious. Kidnapped, tortured and bashed to death. And then thrown into a septic pit and buried. Do you still grapple to get your head around the, the way they did it? Yes, to be so brutal about it. Pretty gruesome. Why she died. Glennis Hayward, a 53-year-old mother of two, had been missing four months when her body was found on a remote property in Western Victoria. I really do. There was something major, major had happened to her. Right from the start, Glennis Hayward's estranged husband, Neil, was the prime suspect. And clearly we knew that, um, well, we felt that Neil was right behind us. He was the one that had so much to lose. As we'll see, Neil Hayward was a violent, controlling and obsessive man. She was afraid not to do what he wanted. 
For over 20 years, he physically and mentally abused his wife, Glennis. I knew straight away. I knew what had happened. What was that? That he had killed her. But before long, police would have their sights set on another man whose identity would have people shaking their heads in disbelief. Glennis Hayward's youngest son, Matthew. It's hard to imagine what must have gone through her mind knowing that the son that she thought she could trust and loved has betrayed her. Glennis and Neil Hayward were once in love. They had two boys, Thomas and Matthew, and for more than 20 years ran a lucrative dairy farm on the outskirts of Mount Gambia in South Australia. I guess they must have had some good times when they first met, but it just deteriorated, yeah. The beatings were ferocious and frequent. Glennis confided in close friend Marie Johnson that she feared Neil would eventually kill her. She was scared of him. I mean, he's beaten her up so badly sometimes, nearly killed her. And he used to brag to people how he tied the missus up last night and gave her a bloody hiding. We heard lots of other stories as, as time went on about her being found tied to a chair inside the house and was found by a stock agent. He released her, she went to the toilet, came back out and begged him to uh, tie her back up again so Neil would find her in the same position when he got home. So a lot of horrific domestic violence. Finally, Glennis had had enough. At the end of 2006, she walked out of the family home, leaving her abusive husband, Neil, and two sons, Thomas and Matthew, behind. Why didn't she leave Neil earlier, do you think? If you're told often enough um, that you're a piece of shit, um, you start believing it. And you believe that nobody would want you. And so you just don't go anywhere because you'd be on your own. But in the end, she became too scared to stay. Glennis moved two hours away to this dairy property where she got a job as a farmhand. But from the outset, she was paranoid that Neil would track her down. She wouldn't tell any of her co-workers here her name or her phone number. And she always had her car packed with her belongings, ready to flee at a moment's notice. We just hit it off right from the word go. But Glennis's life was about to change. After years of abuse, she found freedom, happiness, and a new man who treated her with respect, Chris Sixton. It was only three months before she disappeared. We were trying to take it slowly because I didn't want her to rush into anything after being in that situation. I didn't want to think that she was take, I was taking advantage of her. Or... From all reports, she just became a new woman once you two got together. She did, yeah. She virtually bloomed as a woman, yeah, yep, yep. The first thing she noticed when she came to my house was we had a bath. Oh, she said a bath. And she was great. She'd come back from the dairy and jump in the bath with a heap of bubbly stuff and she had a glass of white wine. It was good. With a new life, new man, plus unprecedented freedom and happiness, Glennis began divorce proceedings. She wanted $2 million of their $6 million estate, but that made Neil furious. He lost control of her, and now he wanted her dead. He was just virtually in, in fear of her life because he'd, he told her if she ever left, he'd kill her. Coming up, the betrayal. I'm going to go in and talk to the police for a few minutes. How Matthew Hayward lured his mother to her death. The whole thing was just a trap. Glennis Hayward had fled her violent husband, but Neil was determined to track her down. He was not only enraged that she'd left him, but she was also asking for $2 million in a property settlement. He just didn't want to give Glennis a penny. He told her that, he said, you'll never get a penny out of me if you leave. Because Neil intended to kill her. He knew that he would probably have to give her half of his estate, and he wouldn't want that. He's a spiteful man and a, and a selfish man. He wouldn't want to share anything with Glennis. In the months leading up to her murder, Neil had done his best to turn sons Thomas and Matthew against their mother, claiming there'd be nothing left of their inheritance after the divorce settlement. Then he set about luring Glennis back to Mount Gambia, using their youngest son Matthew as the bait. The whole thing was just a trap. 
to get her to come down to Mount Gambia. And she definitely trusted Matthew and she loved him and she was very, very happy that she thought that he still loved her. But Matthew had been totally brainwashed by his father and he knowingly took part in the plot to kill his mother, inviting her to Mount Gambia for dinner. Glennis made the trip back to Matthews on the 23rd of July 2007, oblivious to her fate. And one of the best things I ever did was I said, well, this is a bit stupid. I said, I, I love you. I told her I loved her before she left, so I'm very glad I did that. That was the last time I saw her. In Mount Gambia, Glennis had drinks with her friend Marie before meeting up with her son for dinner. Chris, he had told her he loved her. And she was so excited. Nobody had ever told her that. And she was excited because she was going to see Matthew, whom she trusted. That was the happiest I have ever seen her. This CCTV footage from the Mount Gambia RSL captured Glenys and Marie at 5 p.m. that evening. It was the last time she was seen in public. Little did I think I would never, ever see her again. She was only staying with Matthew. Glennis was elated to be with her son, but for Matthew, it was all an act. And what she didn't know was that at the very same time, her husband Neil and an accomplice, farmhand Jeremy Minter, were preparing to kill her. I think Jeremy, um, uh, hard to say um, without putting a label on him, but I don't think he, he's not the smartest tool of the, it's in the shed, old Jeremy, and uh, I think he got sucked in a lot by, by Neil. Neil was a very controlling sort of person and I think he just wanted to, to please Neil. Sometime that evening, Matthew asked Glennis to visit a house he was considering buying. So after dinner, I thought I could take you down and show you. I love that. But it was a terrible lie. Instead, he led his mother into a fatal trap. Uh, Matthew walks in with his mother. Uh, Jeremy and Neil jump out. They grab uh, Glennis and throw her to the ground. And at that stage, Matthew just turns around and walks out, uh, turns his back on his mum and walks out. Neil then starts uh, kicking her in the head and she starts to bleed from the nose. Um, he then, uh, with Jeremy's help, they uh, hog tie her with rope. Uh, and then she was loaded into a, a wheelie bin and was put on the back of this four wheel drive ute and then driven to another property outside uh, at Mount Gambia. At that point, Neil Hayward's accomplice, Jeremy Minter, is dropped off. Neil heads off towards the Victorian border with Glennis in the back of the ute, beaten and barely alive. Uh, you can't imagine the fear that she would have been going through. She would have been alive in that wheelie bin, um, in pain after being assaulted. And uh, she'd know, she would know that Neil was taking her somewhere to kill her. She would have known that. The following day, Glennis never returned home to her boyfriend, Chris Sixton. And I just started ringing a, a phone non-stop, and it was just ringing out and going to message back. Chris Sixton reported Glennis Hayward missing on the 27th of July, 2007. When police interviewed her son, Matthew, as the last person known to have seen her alive, he already had a story worked out with his father to tell them. I gotta go in and talk to the police for a few minutes. I'd appreciate it if you just leave me alone. He told us that she uh, arrived at his house at about 6 p.m. that night. Um, she cooked dinner for him. He said that at about uh, well, sometime during the evening she received a phone call. Um, and she said it was from a male friend and this male friend was going to come around and collect her about 10.30 and they were going to go off for a little holiday over to Melbourne for a couple of weeks. But the police didn't buy that story. Her car was left there, her belongings were left there, her medication was left there, and uh, she just apparently walked out late at night to, to travel interstate with some other, uh, some other person, uh, which the son never uh, uh, identified or he never made any inquiries about. It just, the whole thing you know, was a bit suspicious. Oh, at that stage, we had strong suspicions that both he and his father were involved in her disappearance and she'd met with foul play. Did part of you just want to go and throttle Neil and say, where is she? Oh, yes. I said that to the to the detectives too, and they said, just call it, don't do anything. They said, uh, he'll have you up on an assault charge. 
just exactly what he wants. He said, just leave it to us. Without a body, the police could only keep the pressure on both father and son and hope a crack emerged. And soon enough, it did. Police needed a breakthrough, and of all places, it came at the local pub. A young man was chatting with a bouncer when he boasted that he'd murdered Glenis. What was important about him and his story was his link to Neil Hayward. It was Jeremy Minter, the farmhand, who helped Neil carry out the terrible crime. So we were lucky in one way that uh, the farmhand had a big mouth. And then things happened. Adelaide major crime detectives and Victoria police converged on the property this morning, about 30 kilometres across the border. Four months after Glenis waved goodbye to her new boyfriend, Chris, her body was found in a septic pit just over the border in Victoria. Only Neil knows how long it was before he, he finally killed her. We believe that he, he tortured her for some time. Glennis's youngest son and Minter were essential parts of a plot to murder the 54-year-old. Glennis Hayward's youngest son, Matthew, along with Jeremy Minter, were arrested for their role in her murder. Could Glennis's murder have happened without Matthew's involvement, do you no, think? No, I don't think so, no. I'll never forgive Matthew. Never. Coming up, Neil Hayward's last defiant stand. He wasn't coming out and he had a stick of jelly knife. Glenis Hayward had completely trusted her 20-year-old son, Matthew, but he had betrayed her. He willfully handed her over to his father and she was murdered. Now he was under arrest, but catching his father, Neil, wasn't as easy. Negotiators were called in, but the wanted man wasn't going quietly. Police say he claimed to be armed and in possession of a bomb. Police found Neil held up in a house 80 kilometres from Mount Gambia. He told us that uh, he wasn't coming out and he had a stick of jelly knife. And finally, after some hours, seven hours, I believe, they accessed the house and uh, found him. There was a lot of blood in the house. He had uh, self-inflicted some stab wounds on himself. Neil Hayward was then charged with the murder of his estranged wife, but he'd never be found guilty. He hanged himself in jail while awaiting trial. He'd like to see the man convicted. I think he's cheated a lot of people out of that by doing what he did do. And then he took the easy way out and everybody said to me, I bet you're glad he's dead. And I said, no, I'm not. Because he was, he was a control freak. He controlled his wife. And he would have been in jail the rest of his life being controlled by somebody else. That's why he hung himself. As for Glenys' son, Matthew, he argued that he'd innocently come to this house with no idea what was about to happen. But the jury, well, it simply didn't believe him, deciding that he'd brought his mother here fully aware of his father's evil intentions. Matthew still denies knowing that there was going to be anything evil transpiring at that house. Do you buy that for a second? It's possible. Matthew kept on saying in court that it, he just wanted to get Gladys there so his father could actually talk to her. It's quite possible that Matthew thought that that was the truth. But then when, when he got her there and, and they grabbed her, why, why did he leave? He could have, could have backed, his, backed his mother up. Today, Matthew Hayward and farmhand Jeremy Minter are serving life sentences for murder with a non-parole period of 23 years. Looking back, do you still feel the same towards Neil? Or, uh, uh, where are your emotions at now? Oh, I, I, yeah, I still hate, still hate the band. And she was only just starting a new life, which she deserved. Yeah, I don't think I'd ever forgive the man. No, never. And how do you feel now when you think back about Glennis? Oh, well, I was glad I had the time with it that I did. But I just, every now and again, I think to myself, I wonder what we'd be, we'd be doing now if, if we were together. Yeah. Up in New South Wales, the Ryans have also had to live with their family tragedy. Jeff's senseless murder. A cold-blooded execution plotted by his wife Helen, her sister Janine and mother Coralie.
Cruelly, Helen Ryan has refused to admit her guilt and to explain her reasons for the crime. I had nothing whatsoever to gain by wanting my husband killed. It still gobsmacks me, because, you know, if he'd been really horrible or he'd um, set the house on fire or he'd done really horrible things, there might have been a weeny little thing that did, but he did nothing, absolutely nothing. Why she did it, I'll never know. All three women are behind bars here at Silverwater Prison and the fractures that emerged during the court case now run even deeper. Initially, Janine was placed into protective custody, but now it's been reported that Coralie has tried to convince other inmates to bash her daughter, Helen, as well. I, I sit here and I think of all the times we were as kids and I just miss him. We all get angry at, you know, Helen and, and what happened. Jeff would want us to stand up and be proud of who we are. And, we can't and, let him down. And not let Jeff mm. down. The killers are behind bars, but Jeff's family is left to deal with the fallout. A burden of grief and disbelief that three women could so coldly plot his murder. I suppose you miss Jeffrey all the time, but do you miss him even more so when you have the family getting together like this? Yeah, that, 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 there's a, just an ache. There's a little empty ache, but all of us carry that little empty place inside that will never be filled again.